Good morning, everyone, and, to, uh, and good afternoon to those of you who are further east, and good evening to those of you even further east. My name is EJ Brin, and I'm the Senior Manager of Strategic Initiatives and Stakeholder Engagement at the BC Council for International Education, and I'm really, really excited to welcome you to part one of our two-part series on climate action and international education. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I live and work on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, and it is my true honor to introduce Elder Larry Grant as a member of the Musqueam Nation for our formal welcome and to say a few words to start off this important conversation we are having on climate action. Larry, over to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I'm Larry Grant from the Musqueam First Nation. Ayasak is my Musqueam name. And I'd like to begin by saying a few words in our language that we have. He looked up to Huinas dot as Emich Netten, Kushwe E to E, to San Tomokut Musquim. Set this something need to swallow the Hilak Dala, E. Tiatala, to Mukalap, Kushwe E to E, to Nawaya, E. Nonamut, to Mukstemal, Kush Society, Muk Tamak, Shwe E to E. I just want to say thank you for having me here for the opening and the welcoming for all of the visitors today that are logged on. And it's really important for us to position ourselves in the places that we are, that we live and that we have grown up in and it's really important to understand that our languages are still here as we are the people that have lived in this area for thousands of years prior to European intervention and it's a struggle to maintain our identity and presence and our value within the society that we live in. So I'm a descendant of Kepalano, who was the warrior that greeted Captain Vancouver of the English and Captain Narvez of the Spaniards that had come here uh, in the 1700s. So that's um, something that is, also important to understand that we still have a fairly strong connection as we still use that name, Pipalana, uh, as our, one of our traditional names that we have that is carried by my younger brother. And it's a little different than a lot of the English European names. Our names that are of prominence can only be used by members of that bloodline. And it cannot be, and usually is never shared outside of the kins that are directly connected to the kin that bear that name. So it's really important to understand that. And it's something I think we need to be cognizant of all of those things. So <clears throat> I know we're talking about the climate action and how it affects us and how our actions will affect us in the future. Almost 10 years ago, I was with a group that went to the Cook Islands and we were interviewing people there and I was there as the elder in the group. 
And at that time, even at that time, when we talk about climate change and how it's been changing and how it's been affecting indigenous peoples, mostly in those areas of the Cook Islands, in their high tides, there was one island that had an airport landing strip there that would go underwater. And that is their first indication that they had there was something happening uh, and how serious it was going to be. So I don't know how deep underwater that airport goes now because it's been many years since I've been down there and how how those people are being affected and I don't think their governments or the first world governments are interested in alleviating that problem in someone else's world and our group went across Canada and ended up in Nunavut. So we were up there in Echalawit, Nunavut, and we were seeing a real change in, in the ice actions during the winter and that they were having challenges with the weather change. And that's uh, something that has been going on. And we, we don't know what effect that has on, on the humans, other, other than the scarcity of the animals that they hunt for sustainability. And that's a real, really, really uh, uh, a big change for them, seeing that the ice and the winters are not as cold as some of their elders remembered and how it's affecting their community because when they're running out of uh, natural foods to hunt and gather, they're dependent on the airplanes and the, and the ships that bring them store-bought food. And if you're up there, a 25 cent bag of potato chips probably costs five, between five and $10. So they don't have industry up there and they, they're not able to hunt and gather food because of the changing climate. And they become dependent on the southern parts of Canada to fly up food to the north. And they end up not being able to afford healthy, healthful foods. So you end up buying junk food because that's all you can afford with the prices being what they are in Nunavut, Iqaluit. So that, and that's all across the north of Canada. So that's something that has been a really, really big change for a lot of our communities. And that's something that I know that they're trying, but I don't think there's very much real effort in assisting the northern communities, the indigenous communities. Uh, they have no problem uh, bailing out the industrial companies that are up there, but they're still not because of the industrial developments grant permission granted for them. It, it ends up bringing toxins into the community where they are not able to have potable water as they always had prior to the industries moving in. And that's really, really tragic because there's, there are numerous indigenous communities across the north and uh, the, the more remote areas of Canada that do not have drinkable water. And there's waters that create really, really serious health issues that we don't think about and we don't talk about because we're down the south here 
and we, we, we have access to the electrical things that we depend on. We have the IT things. We can log on instantly. We don't have to dial in and wait for an hour and a half or two hours to get a connection. So that, those are a lot of the things that we don't think about. And, and I know in that Cook Island tour, we flew from Vancouver down to Hawaii, across Hawaii to the Cook Islands, and then back. And then across Canada to Ottawa. Then from there, we flew up into Nunavut and back. <clears throat> so a lot of those actions that we do, uh, I know that we can connect today. I know, uh, especially after this almost a year with COVID-19 isolation, that we can connect all around the world. But as we know, I'm talking to a whole group of people that I have no idea what impact my words are having or the reactions, the body languages that are so eloquent in, in expressing the individual's either like or dislike of whatever is being presented to them. And, and the energy that you pick up from face-to-face -face meetings is really, really something that I know affects the way that I speak at different uh, conferences. And talking to my computer screen is uh, sometimes very unnerving because you're not sure of the things that you're saying, how annoying they might be or disregarded just by missing body language. And that's, uh, I think that's an issue that everyone has that has been doing public presentations, uh, doing presentations in universities and in different institutions. The body language tells you so much about what you're saying and presenting that you cannot experience on Zoom. And that's the other challenge that we need to understand regarding our actions in face-to-face -face meetings, it has shown since the isolation began that the atmospheric conditions have improved hugely by the, 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 the lessening of air transportation and different travel around the world, different uh, modes of transportation around the world that are fueled by fossil fuels, so it's uh, been a big change. So I just wanted to say those few things to sort of set the tone, maybe a better feeling about how we are as ind Indigenous peoples and how the industrial solution to climate action is going to affect indigenous peoples, people of color uh, and remote communities because in the good times they're completely ignored their concerns as long as the industrialists are getting their way. And then now when there is so much concern, the added the added tension, the added trauma, and the lack of knowing each other, the trials and tribulations that we all carry, we do not know what the other person carries. And that goes for different countries. And also in the sense of uh, global, global interaction.
that's really, really the thing that is so important that we today, since European intervention, have been pushed aside and ignored uh, systemically and our lands and our resources have been harvested by the industrials, the opportunists, and disregarding the effect it has on indigenous peoples and people of color. So that's really been a big thing that uh, we've been talking about here on the coast. So I just wanted to throw that in that that has to be a part of the conversation. So I say thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this time and allowing me latitude to be part of this opening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elder Larry Grant. Um, thank you for sharing your history and your stories and sharing with us the impact that climate change has had on your community. I really think um, that stories like the ones you shared today are important for us to reflect on as we continue our discussion on climate action and really in all of the work that we do. Um, and I really wanna invite everybody who is here today to take a moment to pause and reflect on what Larry has shared with us to share their land acknowledgements in the chat box and I know it's not quite the same as being in the room together. I, we talked about this before this webinar started. It is really hard, um, mm -hmm. this disconnected world we're living in. But if I encourage you also to um, write in the chat box your feelings and your responses to what um, Elder Larry Grant has said, um, if you feel comfortable. And so I'll give a few minutes for um, everybody to share that. Thank you, Carrie, for sharing that. Yes, thank you, Carrie. Hi, Scra. Hi, Scra. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, I think um, please feel free to continue to add in. I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping notes at this point. Um, so as we've started, um, you'll notice that the session is going to be interactive. We're also going to have polls throughout. And so we thank you for agreeing to our respectful workplace policy and also our participant gu guidelines that we sent out prior to this session. Um, we really want to uh, create a welcoming, growing, respectful and safe environment for everybody to be together as much as possible. Um, while microphones have been muted, there are many ways we can interact. The chat function, which many of you have already um, uh, used, that is seen by everybody. Um, you can also um, ask if you have technical questions. Terilyn and Gab will be behind the scene. Thank you, TL and Gab, for helping us out there if you have technical questions. Um, and then also we have the Q&A um, section. I see there's something that's come in already. Um, if you can ask questions um, in the Q&A, people are able to upvote and then also extend on the question if they want to add a second part. You can ask questions anonymously or um, use your own sort of uh, username uh, there. Um, but um, that's a great place to ask Q&A. Uh, we will have 10, 15, well, I think we have 15, 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. But as I said, feel free to input them as we go along if, if you have questions that come up because we can bring them up earlier. Um, now, without further ado, I do want to introduce um, our moderator for the series who will introduce the rest of the panelists. Um, so CJ Tremblay is the manager of marketing at IPP and IPP at Paragon Testing Enterprises and also the VP of the board of um, Canny. And she will introduce the speakers for today and uh, get us started. So over to you, CJ. Thanks so much for leading. Thank you so much, EJ. Um, it's been such an exciting uh, process to develop the series together and the first ever collaboration between BCCIE and Canny. Uh, thank you so much to those of you who are joining us um, for taking the time to be with us and to have this very important conversation. 
Um, as EJ mentioned, my name is EJ Tremblay. I work for the Canadian Academic English Language Test, where um, out of Vancouver. Um, but I did want to take this opportunity to say that I am joining from unceded traditional territor territories of the Coast Salish peoples of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Silvertooth nations, where I am able to live and work. Um, and a heartfelt thank you to um, Elder Larry Grant. Our discussion today really is grounded in this important connection to and awareness of the land. So as you heard earlier, um, and what you'll continue to hear throughout this discussion is that our work is inextricably linked um, to these negative impacts. And so um, on our climate. So my increasing awareness of these impacts and my sustainability journey is part of what brings me here today. Um, in addition to my work at the Kale, I am a founding member of the Climate Action Network um, for international educators, which was founded about a year ago. So quite new um, to spark dialogue, elevate and share the work that's being done in this sector around the world and galvanize the sector to raise its collective ambition on um, climate action. So with that, um, I do want to get to our speakers momentarily, but first I also want to get a sense of just who's in the room. So I have a couple poll questions for you as a pulse check just to see how everyone's feeling. So we want to ask um, if we can launch those polls about what is your role at your organization um, and so are you sort of an internationalization president director, international student services, international partnerships, marketing and recruitment, faculty member, sustainability practitioner, or other? Uh, if you're other, like, please feel free to um, pop it in the chat. But um, so if we want to share those results and if you uh, if we've got give you guys a couple seconds to answer those we're going to keep you on your toes today with answering those polls um so if we could see those results awesome so we've got a really good mix of people in the room and that's great because it takes a lot of different people to move us forward as a sector so thank you for sharing that um, for those of who will be watching the replay, um, it was a really good mix all around. So that's really great. Um, and then a quick pulse check on how we're all feeling. And this is a good baseline question, um, which is how confident are you that in uh, your knowledge of the intersection of climate action and international education to drive change? We're all friends here. This is a safe place. It's all anonymous, but are you not at all confident a little bit confident, somewhat confident, or very confident. So take a second to answer that question. And I'm super interested. Everybody has a different sustainability um, journey and climate action journey. So I'd be super keen um, to see what those responses are. You can go ahead and share that. Awesome. So there's Again, a good mix, 20% not at all confident, 35% a little bit confident, 30% somewhat confident, and congratulations to the 7% who are very confident. That's great. Um, so it's funny because I can share that I've been in the same place and I, don't, I did not answer very confident. Um, I was recently trained by former Vice President Al Gore as a climate reality leader by his organization, the Climate Reality Project. And the training is not about becoming an expert in climate science and uh, or climate change communications. There are plenty of those. Um, and I cannot stress this enough. I am not a climate expert. Um, the work of that training was about finding the intersection of the climate reality and every person's own area of expertise to identify their climate story and their path to taking climate action and raising collective ambition in their own sector. And so this is the climate action series. Climate action is a very specific and narrow subset of sustainability, but as we heard, climate change has wide ranging and profound impacts. Climate action is one of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, 
number 13. Um, and, but of all of the goals, uh, it's the only one with a very short runway to drastically change with leading scientists saying we've got about a decade to cut greenhouse gas emissions by at least 45% before the climate, we reach a climate emergency that we may not be able to come back from. And as an organization, Candy made the choice to focus on raising the carbon consciousness and drive to take action for professionals like everyone in this room, administrators, faculty, staff, who are working on the business of international education. So we focus on you rather than the students, which is unusual given for the most part, pretty much everything that we do, we center our students. Um, but this was a deliberate choice because the next five to 10 years are the most critical in the climate action fight. And people who currently hold not just the power, but the purse strings, that's us, we have to take action now on behalf of our students. So this today is for and about you. So we're facing some big questions and you know, where and how do we begin to reconcile our work of creating global citizens, which is vital work to solving big problems with the carbon footprint of the way that we do business and the unequal distribution of the negative effects of climate change. And that's really critical um, because climate change has and will continue to disproportionately affect Black and Indigenous people of, and people of color. Um, and th those are also groups that increase, that face increased systemic barriers to education. Climate justice is then foundational um, to all of the work around climate action. So here today, we are here to learn and begin to dive into the specific intersection of climate action, racial justice, international education. And we are joined by three incredible speakers. Um, in this case, they are actually experts in their own right and each also have their own unique climate story, which will no doubt leave you inspired and curious about where and how we can change for the better uh, in the way that we do business in this sector. We will hear from, starting with Dr. Jenny Moore, who is the Director of Sustainable Development and Environmental Stewardship at BCIT. She's gonna to talk to us about sustainability, the big picture and how climate action fits into that. We're going to hear from Robin Shields, who is with us today uh, from Bristol University in the UK. He's a professor of education. Um, he's going to make that connection to international education as well and talk about that intersection. And then we'll hear from Njoki Mboto, who's a graduate in land and food systems at the University of British Columbia um, and is part of the 2020 cohort of Vancouver's Foundation Youth Policy Program. Um, and she is a peer mentor in the Environmental Youth Alliance. So we've got an action-packed agenda for you today. And we're going to start with Jenny Moore. And it is my privilege to introduce Jenny. Um, you've read her bio on, her, on, her, on the website. She is a proper sustainability expert. Um, in a short time, Jenny had a profound, like from a personal standpoint, had a profound impact on my sustainability journey. I am sustained by her and her work and our discussions, and I have no doubt it will be the same for our audience today. Thank you so much uh, for being here and having this conversation, Jenny. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Awesome, so, so I guess I'll start with this and just sort of let you do your magical thing. Okay. Um, if you could share with us that big picture of sustainability and where climate action fits in and how we start to acknowledge that we're part of a bigger problem and how do we start to enact change. Just a couple of big questions to set us off. Okay. Well, CJ, I think you're becoming an expert in your own right. You're very humble. Um, so at the risk of uh, repeating a few of the big messages that CJ already provided, I think it's really important to start with this concept of uh, the global phenomenon, which is actually not climate change. It's uh, we live in this age of the Anthropocene. Scientists are now um, calling it that because humans are the greatest force creating changes in our terrestrial and global ecosystems. We're moving more energy materials now than nature systems can do on their own. And so 
Uh, and, and by that, I mean, think about the dams that we have in our rivers, changing the course and flow of water, fossil fuels, which are a compacted historic biomass that we're now moving and burning at a phenomenal scale, and also land changes. So humans are, uh, we're on a much bigger unsustainable trajectory and climate change is nearly a symptom of that. And I think that's the most important thing for us to understand. The fight against climate is a fight against ourselves and an unsustainable trajectory that we've been on for centuries now since the industrial revolution. And a big part of this stems from an inequitable approach between who has access to resources. So who takes and benefits from that and using those resources and then who is left behind. And for those of you who remember the sustainable development catchphrase that was coined in the 80s. It's development that enables um, improvement of our current generations without uh, disabling future generations to have similar opportunities. And it's also about uh, not just intergenerational equity, but it's also within our generations enabling everyone to have access to the resources they need to lead a safe, just and dignified life. So the safe space for humanity is an essential concept. And what we see in climate change, of course, is that the use of fossil fuels has enabled many of us to now through technology innovation lead fantastic lives and that's great and we want to continue to be able to benefit from that but we haven't done it for everyone and there are so many people now on the um, living that we actually cannot just use technology to try and solve for efficiency because of the global inequ uh, inequities that we face that started with colonization. So we see this approach of groups going out and appropriating other people's resources uh, similar story with indigenization. It's the same story, appropriating them to ourselves and then enabling ourselves to uh, move forward at the expense of others. So this equity between benefit takers and risk or cost bearers is essentially important in the climate conversation and on the total transformation of sustainability that we need. And as we go forward, thinking about our global economic system and how that continues to enable or perpetuate this inequity, we find the connection immediately with international education. So historically, people who, who are able to participate in international education through travel are coming from the wealthier families. And by enabling that, we continue to perpetuate a structural poverty trajectory where the haves continue to have and have more and the have not simply don't even have access to the benefits of education or to the benefits of international education. And I think COVID has given us a great opportunity to take a pause and to think about how can we capture all the benefits of intercultural, international education that's so valuable, but do it in ways that actually, like COVID, starts to emphasize the social connections that we can make through virtual technologies, enabling access to these programs, and de-emphasizing the physical proximity supported through air travel. So I think this is a really pivotal point. The connections are clear. How do we as international or, or even local educators start to make the connections between climate change a balanced approach to access for education for everyone and incorporating sustainability in an international education um, strategy that, that makes this shift so we can bounce forward coming out of COVID into a more sustainable international education approach. So that's my very quick high level and I'm happy to answer any questions. Amazing. Um, so thank you so much. As always, eye-opening, invigorating, so much to think about and um, I'm so grateful for your sustain your perspective and particularly as a sustainability practitioner within an institution like that's super I'm really keen to dig into that a little bit more um, and we met in sort of the context of understanding collaboration between a sustainability department and an international office and so I just wanted to do a quick poll with our audience um, to see if you as an international office are currently collaborating with your institution sustainability office. Um, like, do you have a Jenny Moore of your very own that you are able to work with at the moment? So yes, no, I don't know, or that you have been engaging sort of within that collaboration. So, um, 
fantastic. So if you could just pop your answer in the poll really quick, just to get a quick uh, sense of that there. Um, and then if we could see those results. Great, so 27% of people who are in joining us today are collaborating with your sustainability office. That's fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to hearing um, and amplifying those stories of what that work looks like. The sector in international is really just starting to dig into that there. So um, I'm super keen, 48% uh, said no and 25 said, I don't know. So here we are. So there's some food for thought there. And I think that there's, we can discuss some of these findings further in session two and how to sort of move forward and engage. And I know that we'll sort of dig into that with Jenny a little bit more, um, but I did want to invite up next Robin Shields, who is the professor of education at Bristol. One of the very first friends of Canny who presented some uh, data at our climate action summit in May. Um, and he just really starts to get at the emissions impact of international education and the bigger sustainability issues um, as a numbers person and myself. Um, I'm a massive fangirl of Robin's work um, and so, and just Robin in general also. So thank you for being here. I'm so glad you're able to be with us and take the time in your evening. Um, how's it going, sir? Thank you, CJ. It's great to be here. Really nice to see you. It's going well here. It's a very dark winter evening. Um, so great to be in touch with people in BC and to discuss these important issues. Just going back to Elder Larry Grant's intro, it really uh, hit home because I, it occurred to me I'm not joining to the best of my knowledge from unceded ancestral lands, but the university where I work was founded by an organization called the Merchants Merchant Ventures Association, which funded overseas explorers who were probably pretty involved in the appropriation of uh, unceded lands. Um, so there is that, it's a sad connection, but there, it kind of oh. drives from the point that everything is connected uh, to some extent here. Um, so that, that was a good way for me to start. So thank you, Elder Grant, for that. Yeah. So on the topic of connection, so Jenny sort of started talking about it a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can share uh, with our audience, like how international education fits into the context that sort of Jenny provided and what sort of some of your research has highlighted. Yes, I'd be really happy to. So as probably most of us know, international education is a huge phenomenon. It has grown a lot in recent decades. If you went back to the turn of the century, there were about 2 million students who went abroad to uh, undertake a full degree. So they did a full bachelor's or master's or doctorate abroad. Now that number is getting close to 5 million or it was before uh, COVID-19. And that doesn't even take into account the rapid growth in short-term mobility programs in semester and uh, full year study abroad programs. So international education is growing uh, at a phenomenal rate. And there's a lot of great things that come along with that come along with that. There's of course increased intercultural understanding and ability to work with people around the world. People gain new skills and they gain confidence and that's all wonderful. But it is unfortunately much more connected to the climate crisis than we might like to think. We'd like to think of international education as being kind of a force for good, working against the climate crisis, but unfortunately that's not always the case. And one area where this is particularly noticeable is in carbon emissions related to international travel at universities. Um, and so um, what I think the reason that we focus on international travel uh, and air travel specifically is that it has one of the largest carbon footprints of any human activity. So for example, if I had flown today from London to Vancouver, this would have released about 1,500 to 2,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that number is a little bit abstract, but um, if you think about it, that's about the weight of a passenger car would have kind of been incinerated and released into the atmosphere. And that's just one person uh, doing an international trip. According to The Guardian, uh, that is more the newspaper, The Guardian, I should say, it's a UK newspaper, that 
uh, amount is more than the entire carbon footprint of the average person in 67 countries around the world. So as Jenny's talk highlighted, it, um, this is really an equity issue. I am saying that my time and my right or entitlement to travel is more important than the entire life in some senses of people in 67 countries around the world. So when we start to look at the, the carbon footprint of all these students, it becomes very, very large. And that's something I've been looking at in my research. So we have very good data on how students migrate uh, for what's called degree mobility to undertake a full degree abroad. And they are getting close to 5 million students who do this. And that generates about 20 million tons of CO2 per year. That's another very abstract number, 20 million tons. But you could think of that if a ton is about the weight of a car again, that's kind of incinerating 20 million cars worth of CO2 and releasing it into the atmosphere. The number might be still hard to comprehend, but it's also about the same as a, the carbon footprint of a small country such as Jamaica or Croatia. It's very similar uh, to the carbon footprint of those countries. So on one hand, this is alarming. It shows uh, those of us that work in the field of international education that we're more connected to the problem of climate change than we think. But on the other hand, uh, it's less than 1% of the global total global carbon footprint and has as Jenny has highlighted, this is climate change is a symptom. It's not really the cause which is unjust and unsustainable exploitation of resources and inequitable inequities in society, I suppose. Um, even if we stopped all international education tomorrow, it wouldn't change very much in uh, the big picture of many of these problems. But it's very important to us as educators because as educators, we have a responsibility to lead by example. We can't say, do as I say, not as I do. We have to teach by example. So we have to reimagine international education in many ways. We need to start by considering the environmental costs of international education seriously. Uh, and as the poll suggested, this happens occasionally, but not as often as it should. We have to ask ourselves and our colleagues serious questions about the benefits of our own travel in relation to uh, the environmental costs it entails. And this probably means we need to reduce travel whenever we can. As staff and faculty, uh, we are relatively privileged compared to students. And if we expect them to take the cost of their travel seriously, we need to do the same with ours first. This doesn't mean doing less, okay? It means being innovative and finding ways to combine trips or travel in less carbon intensive ways like rail. If you enjoy traveling around the world as I do, and I'm sure many of us do, it means that we can remain internationally engaged. It just means we take many fewer visits and perhaps spend longer uh, abroad when we go. Second, we have to recognize that we're part of a system that's unsustainable. And we need to think about how we can change the system more broadly. We call universities ivory towers to kind of suggest that they exist independently of society, but actually we're deeply embedded in society, okay? This was driven home to me in the pandemic when many universities, including my own, chartered flights for international students because they weren't able to find tickets on commercial airlines. So I might like to think universities are fine, uh, travel has a carbon footprint problem, but actually we are completely connected. Uh, and so much that the uh, most universities as we know them today couldn't really exist without uh, large numbers of international students. So we really need to transform universities and other educational institutions so we're not dependent on unsustainable chains of consumption. And this goes beyond just travel, but to think about the jobs that students are preparing for, the industries they'll work in, um, these connections to unsustainable patterns of consumption extend even more deeply. So we need to prepare students to transform the world after graduation rather than to be successful in a world that has fatal flaws. And finally, on those lines, we need to see the climate crisis as just one aspect of a greater social justice problem. And I think Jenny's comments really highlight that. It's not just about environmental sustainability for its own sake, but it's also about the rights of future generations of younger people today who will suffer the most from climate change and vulnerable communities, particularly indigenous communities, as uh, 
Elder Larry Grant's comments highlighted, who are the most vulnerable to climate change and who will suffer the most and will suffer first. For me, seeing the climate change uh, school strikes that took place around the world in recent years was really a moment in seeing the big disconnect between perhaps older people today and uh, young people in terms of how they see the impact of climate change in their life. So recognizing climate change as a social justice issue means considering it, its intersections and connections to other social justice issues such as racial justice, epistemic justice, and justice according to gender and in the LGBTQ community. So this means that we have to ensure that international education opportunities represent and include diversity in all these areas. It means ensuring that the curricula that we present to students and the pedagogies we use are anti-racist, anti-sexist, and anti-ableist. And it means ensuring that we have epistemic diversity in our curricula, that we're not privileging Western scientific knowledge, which has been deeply implicated in the use of resources that is so unsustainable um, and considers other perspectives. If we expect our colleagues and students to fight for a future, it has to be a better future for everyone rather than just a continuation of the present. So we need to engage seriously with other conversations around social justice in education and look at how climate change is part and parcel of these bigger struggles. So I'll wrap up there, but really looking forward to discussing uh, this topic with everyone in the audience. Uh, as always, um, thank you so much, Robin. Uh, I always leave more informed and uh, inspired. And I think that, you know, we're starting to see that in the comments. Um, I, as you know, and as I've shared the, the, the research that you did providing some baseline data, because we just don't really have that much in terms of that intersection right now um, on the impact from just an emission standpoint, never mind sort of the whole big picture, but from an emission standpoint. And I just wanted to clarify something from the audience, and I know you and I have talked about this before, is that um, 20 million tons of mm -hmm you know, effectively emissions from Croatia or Jamaica annual emission. Yeah. That is simply, uh, that doesn't account for any faculty or staff or administrative. Absolutely, practice. yes. And I, I, the one thing, my one uh, kind of reluctance about that number is I feel faculty and staff should be the ones to um, cut first in a way. Students who are going abroad to complete a degree have one of the more legitimate reasons to travel, I would say. And faculty or staff flying for lunch somewhere around the world, you know, we, we have to kind of uh, hold ourselves to greater account than students, I think. Um, so I would guess I probably fly, I don't know about you, but probably five to 10 times as much as my students or I did before coronavirus. And so that's something that's got to change first, I think. Oh, absolutely. And I have shared this a number of times in my sustainability journey. I remember flying literally to Ottawa for lunch once. Yeah. Um, so these are things that I reckon with, um, and I think that we all reckon with. Um, what you mentioned really with flying being the most carbon intensive activity um, that humans undertake, it often also serves as a really point, good point of introduction to climate, because sustainability can feel so big and where do we start, but sort of taking that sort of personal agency and it's a, it's a good sort of starting point that you can measure for yourself as a single individual. Yeah, absolutely. And the great thing is the alternatives are so exciting. I, before coronavirus, I took a trip to Amsterdam uh, and I went by Eurostar and that took two kilograms of carbon. <laughs> Eurostar has a, has, has a carbon calculator and I had a great time. You know, it, it was an exciting way to travel. So there, awesome. there are options out there and we need to make the journey part of our education in a sense. Fantastic. Thank you always um, again for sharing that. Um, and I wanted to pose the following two questions with respect to travel to our group. So there are two poll questions before we go to our last speaker, which is to your knowledge, is your international office tracking student travel? So that's our first question. Is your student, is your office tracking international student travel as far as you can tell for the purposes of emissions or offsetting or just trying to get a baseline or all, this may be part of a program. Um, so if you want to take a quick second to answer that um, and then possibly 
share that with our, we can share the results, give everyone a few more minutes to, a few more seconds to uh, do that. If we can share those results, see where we're at. Um, great. So 48% say, no, we're not tracking it. 25% say, yes, we are tracking it, which is fantastic. Um, and 27% at, I don't know. So there's potential for some yeses and potentials for some no there. So thank you so much. Now we're going to ask the same question for um, faculty or administrative staff travel. So are your, is your institution uh, or your international office specifically tracking faculty and or administrative staff travel? I also get to answer these. Perfect, so we'll give you just one more quick second and then if we can see the results, because this is not not related to what we're gonna be doing later um, and what we're gonna be looking at in the second session. So yes, 24%, similar numbers to the previous question. So yes, no, I don't know. Um, and I think that that's great. Um, and please do uh, continue to post your comments in the track. That's a great reminder, Nicole. Um, so I encourage you to continue this discussion. We've got one um, last speaker and I'm very excited to talk about, um, you know, some of these results in our next session next week. Um, but first, I'm super excited for you all to hear this new voice in our sector doing some incredible work. Um, if any of you follow me on Twitter, you might have seen me gush uh, talk really gush about whatever you want to call it about all our panelists and particularly this next guest floored me with her work at an institution um, and I'm so glad she was willing to join us for this conversation today um, and Jokey please turn on your camera and join us on screen hello can you see me I can thank you so much for being here how are you I'm good I'm good yeah. I'm good. perfect <laughs> So in the summer, uh, you, you know, we've talked about this, you completed a report that focused on a specific unit at UBC. And I'm wondering if you can share uh, with us and tell us a little bit about your research, um, the findings in the report, and also if you can provide a little backstory on how it came about. So I'm gonna leave you with that. Awesome. Thanks for the question. Um, I would like to begin by just thanking Elder Larry Grant for his time with us today. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. I hope my audio is good. Sometimes it tends to fade. So if that happens, let me know. Um, my name is Njoki and I just graduated from the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. And over summer, I did have a part-time position with the title of Project Assistant Global Engagement and the Climate Crisis. I was so happy to look over the participant names and see some of the people that I worked alongside and my supervisors too. So thank you for being here, all of you. And Matt and Hannah, hello. Um, so this project came about uh, particularly due to the efforts of two folks, uh, their names are Matt and Hannah. They are sustainability coordinators at UBC. This is a program within the UBC's sustainability office that seeks to promote um, employees and support employees with opportunities and resources to implement sustainable practices within their departments. Uh, I can quickly share that, there it is. Um, that's just a link about what the sustainability coordinators program is. So Matt and Hannah applied for a grant for their research, at a grant which would actually facilitate the research that I would do about what to a specific office is doing uh, within UBC. So the office, uh, was the Office of the Vice Provost International, which advises the university, that is the University of British Columbia, on international partnerships and develops innovative international programs for students and faculty. There's about more than 300 partnerships, a, di a diverse range of partnerships. We have research, study abroad programs, exchange programs. And I was looking specifically at student mobility, which is ma which is managed by uh, in the Go Global Office. Uh, so the Local office manages inbound and outbound student mobility, which again includes exchange programs, study abroad, and research abroad. My role as a research, as a project assistant, um, was helping to answer two main questions. So the first question was, what can university international offices do to tackle climate crisis? And the second question was, 
what does the future hold for international education in light of the climate crisis? Um, there's a lot of time spent reviewing other university documents uh, and, and learning about the publications. I was reading a lot with, from different platforms about, you know, what the climate crisis is and how it intersects with COVID-19, which was really early on at that time. Um, and I was coming across a lot of webinars that are looking at climate action, climate activism, but there wasn't much or much information on how international education and the climate crisis intersect. Um, two particular webinars that I think informed me or really helped guide my research were through the Canadian Bureau of International Education, as well as another webinar by the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. So that was a good uh, place to really get into to the excitement of, the, of this intersection of international education and the climate crisis. Out of the research that I was doing, what I came to really see was that there is a somewhat interesting pull on two different sides. So for example, UBC, we have the UBC Global Engagement Strategy. And the strategy is really founded on two main pillars, which is global citizenship and contributing to a better world. At the same time, we have the UBC Sustainability Strategy, which quote, quote, lead globally and locally in sustainability and well-being across our campuses and communities, end of quote. So those are really beautiful missions. Um, at the same time, my research, when I was looking at my research, I came to see that there was a critique given to universities where a lot of universities want to have this global citizenship, they want international internationalization. At the same time, they want to be sustainable. So then sustainability then you think of how they want to do this global citizenship is bringing certain guests over to increase the number of international students. So there was, there was that disconnect between, well, if you're going to be more of an international univer university and as Robin said, rely on such an international student body, how in other ways are you promoting sustainability? And what I particularly was getting quite frustrated with is this emphasis on individual responsibility. So the emphasis on students, oh, students pack, pack sustainable, pack reusable bottles or, or um, I don't know, measure your own carbon emission, track, calculate them and just keep them in at the back of your mind. There, that is understandable and important. At the same time, I think that for the immensity of this challenge, which is the climate crisis, there is also an institutional responsibility. So when I, wrote my final report, I definitely did have the individual recommendations, uh, which ranged from, of course, students taking a module before they leave, a pre-departure module before they leave for their exchange programs, which helped them understand the impact of their travel, not only on the environment, but also on the social, on the, on the social and cultural aspects of the communities they were visiting. So that's, for example, an individual recommendation. At the same time, I included institutional recommendations for the students that are coming to UBC and those that are leaving UBC. And those included thinking about how the university can itself create a sustainable offsetting program for the students, uh, but also how can the university change how it does partnerships? Do we need to be flying in certain guests or flying to meet certain guests in order to establish a partnership? So these are some of the things I was really thinking about. And my recommendations definitely took into account time versus scale, because while we want to do a lot of things and we want to change and of course be the number one sustainable university in whatever country we are in, we have to think of two things. One is time. How long will it take to develop, to design, to launch and to evaluate our programs? And two is the scale, is how many people and partnerships are involved, how much funding is necessary. And interestingly, as we're trying to implement this program or initiative, are we still emitting carbon emissions? Are we still doing harm? How is it that what we're trying to do to help could still be the problem? Um, and during my research, I was very, uh, I felt very grateful to find that some of our faculty members had actually taken it upon themselves to begin questioning their flying. And four faculty members have established something at UBC called the Zero Emission University. So you can find that at zeroemissionuniversity.com. And they have four calls to action uh, for anyone based at a Canadian institution who travels for professional reasons. And one of those is to monitor your own uh, emissions. Two is to prioritize your travel needs. 
Three is to reduce how much you travel and four is to advocate for your own institution to um, change why it needs its faculty members to travel or how many times it needs its faculty members to travel. Because as you said, student mobility is just one part of it. I think something that I thought to, to close off that I thought was curious is what Jenny was really highlighting is, is the privileges that exist within student mobility. For example, at UBC, we have approximately 20% of our student body actually participating in international education programs. And UBC is quite a large institution. So we need to investigate the root causes why students are not participating. Um, we need to understand who is flying, how are they able to afford multiple flights, what status do they hold when they arrive at the destinations, why are they able to afford these programs, and are they establishing ethical and meaningful relationships with the communities that we that we that we visit or whose 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 homes we are actually visiting and invited to, or are we just going to learn, take, and leave? Um, so to close off, I, I recommended this and I include this in my report is that UBC and other institutions represented here must begin and proceed with a genuine acknowledgement of indigenous sovereignty. UBC is on traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of Musqueam nation. We cannot cultivate a culture of internationalization, global citizenship and sustainability if we continue to operate from a framework of displacement, anti-Indigenous racism, white saviorism, and an erasure of Indigenous knowledge systems and peoples. I like to say to myself, how can I cultivate a sense of belonging without the need to displace, to dominate, or to erase? Thank you. Wonderful. And Joki, thank you so much. Um, as That was just, yes. You can tell I'm sort of, that was really wonderfully said and I'm so glad that you um, are able to share that with us. Um, I think our audience uh, is deeply appreciative um, of you taking that and sharing and hearing your perspective. And so really um, and when we talk about the future, like we're so blessed to have you here and so grateful for the conversation that we're gonna continue. Um, and so, while I ask my last poll question, um, I will encourage our panelists to turn on their cameras for our discussion. Um, and so while we're doing that, the question that we have for you is, has your sort of building on Njoki is, has your international office started to look into opportunities for transformation for sustainable international operations? Um, and so that can, you know, a formal report or some sort of formal resources. We talk a lot about doing this off the side of our desk, um, but sort of an investment in sort of understanding and collaborating to sort of put something together there. So I'm happy to, uh, there we go. I have answered the question <laughs> um, and great. So thank you so much to um, all of you for joining us. We are all on screen and here we go. Yes, no, and I don't know. Um, closer than before, so 36% yes, 41% no, and 23% I don't know. Okay, well, as always, um, that was really wonderful. Thank you to all of you um, for your words and for really sharing your knowledge with us today. We're going to get right to it because there's lots to talk about. Um, if you you guys want to unmute yourself um, when you are ready to speak. I am going to start a question directly for Njoki. I'm following up on your report. It's quite recent. Um, and I'm wondering if you can share since presenting it, what the feedback was like and what changes have taken place. I mean, I know it was the summer, but it would be great to hear sort of that. Yes. I, yeah, the, I did conclude the position in August. So it's really recent. And as I said, I was working with uh, two offices, the Office of the Vice Provost International and UBC Go Global, which together facilitate international partnerships and student mobility, uh, respectively. I was actually able to reach out to my previous supervisor, Matt Lyle, and ask what the progress was with regards to uh, the recommendations. And actually, when I presented it, it was really well received, so I'm grateful for the colleagues who were helpful in just answering all my questions and uh, taking into the into account the recommendations I offered. Um, 
at the moment we already I prepared a student module which students as I said will be taking before they before they leave for exchange programs or summer programs so that is already up on our digital learning platform on, at UBC so students are able to access that as part of the pre-departure um, process so that's exciting um, and it's mostly about sustainable travel and looks at how our travel is not just having environmental impacts, but has other impacts beyond that. There's cultural, social cultural impacts, there's economic impacts. So we need to think more about, you know, how we're traveling and what that means, not only for us, but also for the people we're interacting with and the spaces we're interacting with. Um, I also learned that um, my supervisor, Matt, is working on a proposal of certain elements that they would like to include in, return, in the return to travel once we are back and able to travel. Um, so on a, the Globe Global website, just to include more information with regards to climate and sustainability so that students have more knowledge as they make their decisions with regards to what programs they want to participate in. So that's going to be really important to have a very clear and accessible platform for all students just to have an information about that. Naturally, uh, due to COVID-19, uh, the, it's, it's, the progress with implementing all recommendations is not as fast paced as a lot of limited capacity with the number of staff at the office, but also the, the other uh, prior, the other jobs and duties that they have. So at this point, we're still, they're still working up to it. Um, hopefully when when the office is able to grow and, and staff members are able to take up more with regards to um, the time on this, so I think we'll have the recommendations coming into action, but I'm grateful for what has been done already and for the warm reception that it had, it, 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 it received, I received. Great. Okay, thank you. This one um, is another, is a question that's come in. So I'm, I'm gonna sort of share some questions from the audience, which are not, um, ex ex they're aligned with what we've been talking about, um, but I'm springing them on you as surprise questions because you haven't seen them before. Um, so, and this is, I mean, likely maybe Robin and Jenny or whoever wants to take a stab at it first is, um, in terms of like the important role post-secondary institutions can perform in addressing climate change, um, sort of that is a question. And is there anything in particular that has been successful or that you would think is successful in moving the dial and prompting action? Uh, maybe I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Robin. So I really think these kinds of conversations move the dial. Uh, they start the awareness and sensitivity to the fact that business as usual is unsustainable. So there's reasons why we do what we do right now, right? There's reasons why we, we are where we are in a climate crisis and a COVID pandemic. Um, so really the opportunity here is for us to just be reflective and curious about what can we do now to keep the benefits of you know, why we, we um, appreciate intercultural exchange, what are the benefits of that face-to-face, person-to-person interaction that undeniably it's, it's always positive, but then knowing as well, where are we um, maybe unconsciously entrenching the very challenges that are facing us? Uh, so how do we become more conscious, more reflective, and, and through our curiosity in these kinds of conversations, start to probe how to be more effective agents for the sustainable transformation we're also seeking? Yeah, I agree uh, with Jenny very much that conversations like these are important. And I give a lot of credit to people who start them, uh, and CJ, because they're, they're very hard to start, I think, in international education. People who work in the field rightly have a very positive view of what they're doing. And so it's hard to say, actually, there's some serious negative things that we have to talk about here. It's um, a difficult conversation to start, I know, in many international offices. So lots of credit to people who are doing that. And then second, I would say students are a huge source of progressive action and progressive pressure at universities. Unfortunately, much more than faculty and often staff, I would say, um, and that, that's sad to say in a way, but um, they're the ones who go on strike when, when the school students are going on strike, for example, who, who march with them, who have probably a much bigger stake in some of the changes that are occurring. Uh, and so, they have, in my experience, they've been very important in kind of moving the needle and how universities think about climate change. And universities do listen to students uh, a lot. So it's important, I suppose, for those of us working as faculty and staff to kind of foster that activism where we see it, to encourage it, 
and to let students know they have a voice. Great, thank you so much. Um, in terms of, you know, this kind of leads into what we've seen before in terms of um, the way international education really entrenched, uh, is entrenching the global crisis, the climate crisis, but also inequality. And we did receive a question about sort of, and this, I know Jenny, we've talked about this and Njoki, you mentioned this, but I think it's worth um, having sort of elevating that discussion again. But in terms of the connection between um, immigration and international education and um, the overall ethics of international education in terms of those um, local post-secondary talent and climate leadership pieces. So um, I would defer to, I mean, maybe Njoki, if you wanted to get us um, started and then we can sort of, if anyone else has anything to add, please feel free to unmute yourself. Sorry, I don't think I understood the question. So the connection between international education as a pathway to immigration um, is part of that journey. And when, um, you know, our responsibility and sort of that awareness, and I know, Jenny, if you wanted to sort of share something as well, but I think that um, are those conversations that we're seeing happening at institutions? Oh, okay. Uh Hmm, I don't, I've not seen too many conversations about that specifically. I've seen definitely people having conversations with regards to how, what international education means for, for the people that are coming into a certain space, but also what, for example, um, how me leaving home as a Kenyan, what that means for me, but also if large pools of young people are leaving Kenya to other countries around the world and not returning, um, to either, you know, to continue uh, living there or to work there, then what does that mean? So I'm seeing that conversation happening separately from how that relates to sustainably. Um, I think this is something uh, we've spoken quite a bit in my program when I was studying is the different silos that are existing in our institutions. And, and it's understandable that we are in large institutions and sometimes having that integration of information can be quite difficult. At the same time, there's a duplicity of projects or initiatives which isn't efficient in terms of its use of resources. If we're doing similar projects that are really heading towards a very clear vision that is that is basically the same, why are we not just collaborating? And I think the challenge comes in when, say, when um, I think Robin was talking about including the diversity of students in our programs and also talking about sustainability, but you will see that those come into two different offices. There is the, is the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and then we have the Sustainability Office. And when a question is brought up about international education and its relation to sustainability, I think the tendency would be to go to the, the Office of Sustainability, but they would also need to integrate the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. So it's really important for even large institutions to stop start breaking down the silos and, and realize the overlaps and the efficiencies that we will really promote when we start clarifying our mission together. Jenny, you're just muted. <laughs> But I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, no, I just said, and Joki, you're so well spoken. I'm always so impressed every time you talk. And I think um, I'll, I'll kind of circle back, but uh, Robin had used this term that I think in Joki's describing, which is institutional hypocrisy, where we have uh, created for ourselves um, different groups with different mandates that sometimes work at cross purposes to each other and um, mask the reality of uh, some of the very things that we could solve if we got together. So I think the the integrated approach between international inclusivity, inclusivity, diversity, um, respect, you know, sustainability, indigenization as well. These are these are important um, synergies that need to be happening across these departments institutionally. And I'm looking forward to doing that at BCIT and then also collaborating across institutions. So Njoki, maybe we can talk or Robin, uh, you know, we've had some good opportunities to start the conversation. In terms of the very important pathway that that education provides for immigration. Um, you know, I think what's really important here also with climate action is this is not an all or nothing uh, 
some. We are not saying never travel. We're not saying don't have international education opportunities that provide physical um, presence in countries. Uh, there's there's a lot of benefit. That's why we do it. Um, but again, it's how do we do it in a way that's more sensitive and in a way that we're really optimizing for the, uh, the positive goals that we're looking for and opening our eyes to the negative side effects that uh, we don't want to be contributing to. And so, um, you know, it's very important both financially for many post-secondary institutions here in British Columbia and probably across Canada, international education now provides a strong financial um, infusion of cash to keep public education running in the post-secondary level. Uh, there are very, very real um, structural elements here. And so I would say I don't have a strong answer on this. We don't want to stop people from having immigration opportunities, but there is there is also a, um, a social disequity there. Again, it's the pr mostly privileged people with access to education who can come to different countries and stay in those countries. So it effectively contributes to a brain drain, if you will. Um, so what are we also doing to enable people who get these educational opportunities internationally to contribute in their home places um, uh, to make positive change so that it's actually appealing to also want to want to stay in place and have education in place. So again, not an all or nothing, some gain. That's not what we're trying to say here, but it is being sensitive to where the negative impacts are manifesting and how do we do a better job around those as well as chasing the positives. Thanks. Perfect. Um, okay, so a quick question that has come in and it's great and it really sort of gets to like the heart of what we're talking about, a mix of sort of our actions and um, the real business landscape, if you will, that we're operating in. Um, you know, so I'm going to read, it says COVID-19 has really taught us that we can do our work in international higher education in many different ways. One being a commitment to reduce in some case, even eliminate travel for recruitment and partnership development. This we can do at an institutional level. However, to have a real impact on the climate, it needs to, it seems a sector wide approach is needed. We can't have some institutions committing to reduce while others carry on with staff, faculty mobility. Um, what, you know, can we be united to pause staff, faculty travel in our sector to make a difference? This is a big problem and addresses sort of almost like the business. Well, I don't want to be the first person to do it because if I do it less then other people will have sort of better opportunities or more students. And so um, it's like, where do we even start? And so I think the, where do we even start given, you know, Jenny talked about bouncing forward, not like building back, but like bouncing forward and like really taking this opportunity to transform. So I think Robin, I'm going to, Send this one off to you first to get us started. Great. Um, I think it's a very insightful question, and it actually goes not just to what we're facing in international education, but really climate change in general, why it's been so difficult to mobilize political action on climate change, because it's what I think game theorists call a prisoner's dilemma, where one person can always kind of cheat and default, and they'll benefit, and the rest of us who cooperate will, will suffer. So if you can... And if, we can do this, then we've solved a huge problem. I, I think, you know, even the idea of possibly uniting, possibly having some sector-wide commitments would be really fruitful. And maybe that's something that we could start to pressure organizations um, like BCCIE to uh, take leadership on, to kind of hold everyone in, in check, I suppose, hold everybody accountable. Um, and internationally, we, we will see the same thing, but, I suppose to think of something, to take a positive spin on it, uh, universities are very good at creating communities that transcend institutional boundaries. And they've done that for many hundreds of years, actually. We've had scholars um, traveling even by foot around the world to, to meet one another. So we may have kind of enough solidarity in this commitment that exists, this community that exists between institutions. It's not necessarily tied to uh, the bottom line for a particular employer to create some positive change and some solidarity on this issue. Thank you. And Joki or Jenny, I wanted to make some space if either of you uh, wanted to add to that. 
All right. Well, thank you for um, holding that one down, Robin. I know that's a big one. Um, and I'm wondering if, um, you know, when it comes to the transformation opportunity and so building on that question, um, what does it look like? What does the work look like? Um, you know, understanding and Joki mentioned, we talked about silos. I know in our previous discussions, we talked about silos. So I did want to ask um, a, a little bit about what does that work look like either at a faculty, you know, we've got faculty, we have sustainability and we have like a, an international office sort of represented here. And so I'm, the last thing I'm going to ask each of you is like, what does that look like in each of your, um, each of your sort of offices, but also how do we avoid um, the duplication of work and the inefficiency and sort of foster that collaboration? And so um, I will uh, sort of maybe Jenny, if you want to lead us off. Okay, sure. Um, so for us, uh, we are having conversations. Uh, I myself as director of Institute Sustainability am having conversations with our director of international and the associate dean of international with the director of indigenous um, partnerships with uh, the director of um, education, respectful workplace and diversity inclusion about these issues. And I think that's the start. Um, you know, the all or nothing sum game, we are all structurally um, trapped, I'll say the word trapped in an unsustainable trajectory. That's fine. Um, you know, what we need to figure out now is how do we work together to do better to solve some of these challenges in ways that uphold the benefits that we all want without or with, re you know, reduced um, the negative impact. So it starts with reflective curious conversation, appreciative inquiry, where we're getting together and, and trying to, um, to work together for solutions that work for everyone. And Joki or Robin, there you go. I've thought a bit about what travel, international travel might look like post coronavirus for me. I do, a lot of international research projects um, and I'm going to try to kind of cut those back and maybe only concentrate them in a few areas where I can maybe go once a year, for example, and have that be my international trip for the year. And then beyond that, I actually want to travel more, but to do it by train in Europe. And I want to document it as much as possible and have as much fun doing it as I can and show everybody how much fun I'm having. Um, on social media or something like that, just to show that uh, it's not really, the goal is not to kind of be uninternational. We have enough populism and uh, xenophobia right now. Um, we don't want to contribute to that. We want to be more international, but um, do it in a sustainable way. And so I want to kind of try and think about what that might look like in practice. Mm, thank you so much. Uh, I think as you were talking one word that popped out very loudly in my head was imagination. Um, I, I don't know if you know this author, her name is Saidia Hartman, and she speaks of, she says, oppression functions through the policing of imagination. And I think that that has something that has really held us down is, is making room for imagination and dreaming differently. And that really can come into account in our education. I think while I was doing this research, I was given so much room for creativity and imagination, which I'm grateful for. And I would say that moving forward, yes, we have some of, some of the platforms that are already doing this. So for example, there is um, like an interdisciplinary education grant happening at UBC uh, that just invites faculty from different programs to collaborate and create something. So we have that faculty member from the Department of Theater, say with someone from the Department of Mathematics, and they can create something. And that's that's awesome. I've just shared it. And at the same time, I think beyond that, we can think of our international education looking different. As students don't really have to travel to another country, a faculty don't have to travel to a whole other country. I think we can just value people where they are. If someone traveled home for uh, the holidays and they actually just happen to have a really profound learning experience for themselves if we can imagine offering them credit for how they choose to present that learning experience back i think that's just awesome i was in a program called global resource systems and we have something called directed seminars and we were we had people literally presenting artwork that showed the relations of different sustainable 
commute food systems and that gave them credit and i think that was that just really that expanded our our excitement for learning for learning so i think international education can absolutely look different yes at Traveling is awesome and that's amazing. Um, and we meet so many beautiful people. At the same time, we can also imagine how tr- learning can look different um, and really be informed and guided by it. the indigenous knowledge systems. For example, where UBC is founded, how much do we know of, of uh, the different knowledge systems within the Masquiam nation with, with about their food systems and so many other aspects. So I think that's it's, um, the creation of imagination and, and just looking at it differently with learning. Thank you so much. That's a like beautiful note on which to end. And I know that we are sort of coming close to the end um, and there are so many questions and comments and questions about toolkits. And we are going to continue to dig into this and we will take the questions from today and we will um, process them and make sure we're addressing everything and for the next session. Um, And in preparation for that next session, I did just want to um, have a quick, we've talked about homework earlier and, you know, we talk about you cannot change what you cannot measure because, you know, as institutions, institutions have a ton of power and I completely agree with Njoki and sustainability is such a huge issue and climate action for me has served as a way in and so just to continue to foster that you know conversation and get everyone thinking you know we've seen some comments about you know what would you be willing to give up and what would you be willing to um, do so as you see here I've shared my screen and I just wanted to share sort of transparently I was wondering because I wanted to understand how I could be better and different in the future. And I just was curious, even just to get started in sort of how to calculate my emissions. And what we're gonna ask you to do is find a calculator. Um, There's lots of footprint, you know, carbon footprint calculators online. We encourage you to, um, you know, I use the carbonfootprint.com calculator. I've been using it forever, ever since I started traveling a little bit more for work. Um, you find a calculator and calculate. So I looked at what my travels were in 2019, just for fun, um, to get an understanding because transparently, like this journey is new for me. And so figuring out what that actually looked like was how many tons did each of my trips emit and what did my total look like? And then I was curious about what my reduction looked like and how that impacted my work in 2020. So you can see the purpose and my work is heavily conference related. And that's where I started having these climate discussions, asking people if they were offsetting their flights and how did they get there? Was it direct? Did they Were they forced to take sort of the less expensive one, even though it meant two connections and just trying to understand where we're at. And when I compared to 2020, um, this is not any heroic effort, but um, I produced 11.14 tons of carbon with my just my corporate travel. And that doesn't account for just existing. Um, and as uh, Robin mentioned, his trip that he didn't take to Vancouver was more than 67, was more than the average person of 67 countries. And that was like maybe two tons. And so when you consider just the corporate travel and ha- for me and everything that I do is in the second half of the year. So I was also grounded for 2020. Um, But the conditions, and this goes to the question that we saw, is that the conditions allowed for conference participation virtually. And so when we talk about what that might look like in the future, we are gonna discuss that further um, in sort of the next little bit. And so I did want to um, just share that with everyone so that we could sort of move forward. And I think with that, I'll hand it back to EJ because I'm very sensitive to everyone's time. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Elder Larry Grant, Njoki, um, Jenny and Robin and CJ for leading us and really kickstarting this conversation. Um, I appreciate all of the words. Um, they were incredible. They really have gotten my my brain going and thinking about what I can do and and really um, 
I think one of the big learnings is that we need to continue having these conversations. We don't have the answers necessarily right there. It's about working through what that looks like for our sector itself. And, and so thank you for sharing your insights and, and kind of really getting us going on this conversation. I really look forward to next um, week on Wednesday at 11 o'clock, um, uh, sort of continuing this conversation um, with some some other really great speakers. Um, and um, so to everybody, thank you again. Um, have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful evening. And we'll see you all next week. Thanks a lot.